thank you for joining Wars of the Roses and this video is going to be discussing Adam and Eve taken from the students monthly letter by Manly P. Hall June 1937 the secret doctrine in the Bible part 2 dear friend we have already suggested that the story of Adam and Eve as given in the opening chapters of Genesis is an allegorical expression of the cosmic processes which resulted in the differentiation of the human species. It is important to realize that the secret doctrine concealed in the Bible must be discovered with the aid of certain keys. Each of the myths, fables, and symbolic figures has at least seven complete and distinct interpretations. In other words, to open the door that is unveiled the secret, the key must be turned seven times in the lock. In the ancient mystery rituals, the key was an important emblem of discovery or enlightenment. Neophytes received symbolic keys as part of their investitures. In the Mithric rites, candidates were taken through seven doors, which they unlocked. And in the Egyptian mysteries of the resurrection of the soul, the aspirant was brought to the gates of fulfillment and was interrogated by the keepers of the gates. It may seem strange that one story or account may have several meanings, but such is the working of the Kabbalah. In the original Hebrew, there were numerical and letter ciphers to aid in the decoding of the hidden information. Translation and editing have destroyed these older Kabbalistic patterns, and it is now necessary to have recourse to the fascinating field of comparative religion in order to unlock the biblical secrets. Adam and Eve as an example, ADM, or Adam, is, first of all, species or kind, meaning a particular generation or genre. Adam is also a symbol of Adonai, the creating Lord. Adam is also Eris, the first sign of the zodiac. Adam is the incarnating ego, the father of the multitudes. Adam is the human principle, perpetuated forever in the seed. Adam is again protogenos, the ideal or archetypal pattern, Plato's idea or logos. Adam is the universe, whose body nature is, and God the soul. Adam is the first race of humanity, and by analogy, the first subrace of each of the following races. Adam is the sun, and also in the story of the Garden of Eden, the typical neophyte seeking initiation into the mysteries. This one symbol indeed plays many parts. The first man becomes the figure of all first things. Of the sciences he is mathematics. Of forms of knowledge he is pure wisdom. Of religions he is the esoteric tradition itself. As we develop this subject we shall try to show you how all of this is true. It is also important to remember that nearly every personality described or discussed in the Bible is primarily a symbol and not an historical individual. It is a great mistake to believe that there is a spiritual virtue in the perpetuation of history or the worship of ancestors. The virtue lies not in the accepting of the sacred writings, but in the discovery and application of the ever-living truths secretly hidden in the scriptural books of the world. The creation of Adam is described in Genesis 2-7. The creating power formed man of the dust. In the Kabbalah this man is called Adam Kadmon, or the species formed of the red earth. The meaning of red earth in this sense is most obscure but certainly has no reference to physical soul. In a cosmic sense, the universe is fashioned of a fiery nebula and the whirling fire mist from which the cosmos was formed is the red earth. The ancient writings in describing the generation of the physical bodies of the animals and human kingdoms declare these vestments, coats of skins, to have been excluded from the auras or superphysical bodies of a divine race which dwelt in space i.e. the Earth's outer atmosphere. This teaching requires considerable explanation. Man consists of three parts or natures. 
The first is the divine principle, a spiritual substance, identical with spirit and space. The second part is a side real nature, sometimes called the soul, and constitutes a superphysical body, the luminous chiton, the garment of glory or aura. The third part is the sublunary nature, the objective body with its several systems, muscular, arterial, glandular, etc. Man as a spirit dwells in the substance of the one or undivided from the divine principle. In the Bible, this state of identity with the Supreme is expressed by the statement abiding in Abraham's bosom. This has the same meaning as the Samadhi or Nirvana of the Eastern metaphysicians at the beginning of the day of manifestation. That great cycle of time figured in Genesis as the seven days of the formation. The innumerable natures of living things emerge from the original unity and God becomes the gods. Whereas the Kabbalah expresses it, the multitudes emerge from the simple unities. This emergence of the gods is their descent into the state of individualized living things. The primordial sparks rolled themselves in the luminous chitons or superphysical bodies. The gods are therefore described as spheres of light and of this order of being is man himself. Inwardly a divine nature participating in the supreme effulgency. This is explained in the Bible by the placing of the spiritual humanity, Adam and Eve, in the paradisiacal sphere called Eden. Here souls dwelt garmented only in light and truth, the auras as yet undefiled by contamination with physical matter. The records of this ancient time are preserved in mythologies of all classical civilizations. It is beautifully described in the Gnostic hymn of the Robe of Glory, wherein the paradisiacal state is represented as the homeland or fatherland which all exiled humanity is seeking. With this key, the mystery of Eden is easily unlocked. Eden and the Angel of the Flaming Sword the atomic being is given domination over the garden, always a symbol of the astral world. What Levi the transcendentalist calls the astral or magical light. The same allusion to the garden occurs in the story of Parsifal. Here Klingzor attempts to delude the Knights of the Grail by creating a magical garden filled with the enchantments of the senses. In some of the ancient books, the universe is called a garden and the plants and suns are flowers blooming in space. With Adam, the human life wave abides also the seeds and germs of several other kingdoms. In Genesis 2.11, the creating power fashions the animal kingdom, the intellect of Adam, named, that is examined and understood all the creations. Kabbalistic figure of Adam in this diagram, Adam Kadmon, the first man, stands crowned with the celestial glory. On his body are the symbols of the ten worlds or emanations. From the figure we are to understand Adam as cosmos or the one life. Manifesting through what Pythagoras called the decad or decimal system. In this symbol, Adam is himself a figure of the tree of life. This interpretation gives a new and richer meaning to the biblical allegory of the first man. The next important allegory relates to the creation of Eve, the female or negative principle. To understand this, we must realize that the original Adamic man, that is, the spirit in its luminous vestments, was in itself androgynous. According to the ancient Jewish legends, Adam was formed with two faces and two bodies, united back to back, and this is with two natures, each facing in the opposite direction. In the authorized version, the creating power is said to cause a deep sleep to descend upon Adam, and from his side Eve was created. Genesis chapter 2, 21 through 23. Eve is the etheric principle called by Plato the principle of generation. 
This exude out of the arc body in the same way that the hard shell of a snail is exude from the soft substances of its body. The etheric vehicle or the feminine principle as it is referred to in the ancient times is described in Genesis as being the tempter. Lack of true understanding as to the meaning of the temptation and the fall led Christian theologists to regard all female kind as the embodiment of temptation and corruption. In fact, the old story to the effect that with Adam's fall we sin us all is one of the most ludicrous errors of theology. Nowhere is it more evident in scriptural writing that the letter of the law killeth than in this particular instance. In fact, the whole Christian theory of redemption and the estate of Christ in the concepts of orthodox theologians depends upon the literal and benighted misunderstanding of the ancient Chaldean myth, long regarded not only as history but as scripture. The third chapter of Genesis opens with the description of the serpent and contains the account of the temptation and fall of the first man. The old Jewish mysteries declare the serpent to be a symbol of Samuel the archangel of Mars and the master of the astral light. In scriptural writings, serpents are frequently used to represent currents or waves of force moving in space. The Midgar snake of the Nordic Eddas and the Orphic serpent twisted about the egg of the year are both symbols of the zodiac and the serpentine course of the sun the erect serpent of Egypt and the hooded Naga of India and Cambodia signify the spiritual fire in man. The winged serpents of Gobi and the Taoist dragons of China represent both the psychic forces of the soul and the initiates or sky men. The Indians of the southwest of America have serpent symbols of similar significance and the Quetzalcoatl or feathered snake of Central America is a symbol of the initiated or high priest. The Druid priests of Britain and Gaul call themselves serpents and these are the snakes that St. Patrick is said to have driven from Ireland. The reader of the Bible should be acquainted with these facts for it is only depth of scholarship and breadth of understanding that one can interpret correctly the serpent symbol in Genesis. The astral light over which Samuel has dominion is the spirit of imagination and desire. In the Kabbalah it appears that Samuel is the adversary, yet in the authorized version there is no explanation for the existence of the tempting serpent or why the all-wise creator should have placed it in the garden to corrupt this noblest work of God, man. The key to this riddle lies in the metaphysics of the Persians, which in turn was derived from the most ancient religious mysteries of both the Near and the Far East. It is explained that good and evil, so called, are but the aspects or qualities of one principle. For example, creation brings into manifestation the innumerable host of lives which lie sleeping in the infinite. In this respect, creation is release or expression and therefore good, but creation also infers certain limits and boundaries being placed upon space. Thus the very world which is man's sphere of opportunity is also his living tomb, and in a sense therefore evil or adverse to the luminous inner self that must dwell so long in the fetters of matter. Every action, therefore, of the creating power is described as bringing into manifestation not only a good, but an evil spirit or angel. A simple explanation of this is the modern problem of invention. Whenever a man invents some new and useful improvement to make life more secure and comfortable, abuse inevitably follows. Good laws are perverted by selfish men. Great ideals are brought down to a thousand purposes, inconsistent with the original dream. Primitive man realized this, and the earliest scriptures teach that the universe is a battlefield of good and evil, impulses which they termed gods and demons. Even as God was the chief and lord of all the benevolent forces, so the evil agencies or negative attributes are personified in one offering being variously named Satan, Lucifer, Yama, Loki, Hades, Kali, etc. In the third chapter of Genesis, the adversary is Samuel, 
the serpent. And like Mephistopheles, it is a spirit of negation, part of the power that still works for good while ever scheming ill. In the Pythagorean formula, unity alone is perfect wisdom. For wherever there is division, desire is born. Desire is only possible under a concept of division, for possession is one of the first of the illusions. Desire leads to an innumerable array of other evils and is itself rooted in ignorance, which in turn is man's inability to perceive the sovereign oneness of all things. The chapter further explains that there are two trees growing in the Garden of Eden. One is the tree of knowledge of good and evil. The other is the tree of life. The symbolism of the tree must also be briefly explained. The world tree is the Earth's axis and occurs in nearly all ancient mythologies. Trees are always symbols of evolution and unfoldment because of all life, tree-like emerges from one root and seed and extends itself into a diversity of manifestation. The Kabbalistic tree of the Sephiroth with its ten symbols is based upon the tree of life in the mist of Eden. The tree is also the symbol of racial development, and nearly all forms of evolution are even now diagrammed under the form of a tree. So also are genealogical systems. The tree becomes the symbol of continuity. Special trees have particular symbolism, as the pine tree of Aetes, which has become the modern Christmas tree, and the cedars of Lebanon, which was a title bestowed upon an order of ancient priests. According to one derivation, the word druid means tree, and the dryads were the tree spirits of the classical Greeks. All these interpretations are significant to the present subject. But there is another, even more imminent in its inferences. There are two great systems in the body of man. The tree of life, which is the arterial, with its roots in the heart, and the tree of knowledge of good and evil, i.e. the nervous system, which has its roots in the brain. These two trees are physical manifestations of a complicated network of branching energy currents in the aura or superphysical bodies. In medieval art, it was customary to represent the tree of knowledge of good and evil in the form of an apple tree. In fact, this fruit has been concerned with two important episodes in the history of man. There was the apple that Eve ate and the apple that fell on Newton's head. These two apples have changed the course of history. The older mythical writings show not an apple but a pomegranate, and Greek statues of Cori and Persephone frequently depict these fertility goddesses holding pomegranates. This fruit also had a place in the rituals of the Eleusinian mysteries and seems to be the original of the Chaldean apple. Madame Blavatsky in Isis Unveiled shows that the third chapter of Genesis was part of an ancient mystery ritual representing the drama of initiation into the higher grades of the esoteric school. In the Kabbalah, Adam is described as attending a school of the angels in heaven. It was in this celestial academy that the first man received the keys to that secret doctrine which has descended through an unbroken hierarchy of initiated priests since the first dawning of human consciousness. The angel Raphael visited Adam and Eve in the garden and discoursed with them concerning the mysteries of the soul. According to Madame Blavatsky, Disobedience of Adam and the eating of the forbidden fruit represented an effort to secure the esoteric wisdom without being properly and duly initiated. In other words, it was a violation of the laws of the mystery schools, an attempt to storm the gates of heaven. For this violation, primitive humanity was exiled from the spiritual state and the symbolic fall occurred. By another interpretation, equally significant, the serpent tempter represents the intellectual principle. This is evident from the words of Jesus in the New Testament, Be ye wise as serpents. The intellectual principle leads to the experience of conscious self-responsibility. This is exile from the Edenic garden of innocence or spiritual infancy. The evolving intellect of primitive man brought with it 
a gradual extroversion. From an inward contemplation of spiritual principles, man came to recognize an external life. Slowly the inner senses were dimmed, and the perceptive powers correspondingly strengthened. The result is man's present state in which he has little, if any, inward life, and is entirely overconscious of the significance of outward circumstances. The inner life is the paradisiacal or Edenic state. The outer life is the relapsed or fallen state. The resurrection promised by the messianic dispensation is the restoring of the inner life and the conquest of the external or sensory sphere. All this is clearly shown in the Buddhistic teaching and is an essential part of the Platonic dicta. The creating power, in its aspects as the law of nature, now pronounces a curse upon the disobedient mortals. They are doomed to the cycle of birth and death. They are no longer supported and sustained by the inward light, but must struggle to survive in a universe of doubts and fears. Exion is bound to his will, and the cycle of necessity has gained dominion over the divine spark, the host of the atomic souls. In Genesis 3.21, it is described that the creating power fashioned for Adam and Eve. Coats of skin, these are the physical bodies the mortal vestments of immortal life. Man's memory of his heavenly state is obscured by the world of matter, and he is cast forth from the abode of peace. At the gate of Eden, the creating power placed cherubims and the flaming sword to guard the sacred garden that Adam and his progeny might not return to it again. It is interesting that Solomon, when he built the everlasting house, should have placed upon the doors of the temple cherubims with the flaming sword. This is the key to the whole mystery. Eden is the first holy of holies. Its significance is identical with that of the Adda'a of ancient temples. It is the heart, the sacred place. It is also symbolic of the state or condition of sanctity. The temple is not a building, but a state of consciousness, an inward realization. He who attends to this realization enters the holy place which is guarded from the profane by the keepers of the gate, the testers or initiators. Philo Judaeus declared the cherubims to represent clouds or obscurities which conceal Eden from the profane. These clouds are the ignorance, the nightedness or perversion of the unredeemed which must forever obscure sacred things. Thank you for watching, and please don't forget to share, like, subscribe, and comment. And we are in need of your help, so please consider donating to Wars of the Roses. Links to PayPal and Patreon are in the description. Thank you very much.